Hello everybody, welcome to the second channel. Today we're going to be answering questions and talking about comments from my most recent main channel video, Watch Electricity Hit a Fork in the Road at Half a Billion Frames Per Second. So this was a really fun video that ended up sort of turning into three videos if you include the two that landed on this channel. And I learned a lot during the process of making this video. So it's understandable that there are lots of questions because these are some pretty complicated topics that we're trying to condense down into video form. So here's our list for the day. And first on that list is you say current, but mean voltage. There were a lot of people that pointed out that my oscilloscope was measuring the voltage difference between the wires, the potential difference between the two wires of the twisted pair. But I was saying that current was flowing. And I want to explain to you why I said that. I was actually calculating the current that was flowing based on the voltage. The reason that I can say that there's current flowing in this wire is that the voltage is changing. In order to change the voltage on a wire, you need to have pushed or pulled charge into that wire. And the act of moving that charge around constitutes an electric current. So in this case, we've got a wire and let's say that, you know, we measured a voltage at many different points across that wire and all the voltages are the same, which means that assuming that the capacitance of the wire all the way along the length of the wire is the same, that electrons within the wire are of roughly equal density all the way down the wire. But what if we had another wire and we measured a voltage profile that looked like this, which suspiciously might remind you of the voltage profiles from the video. So in this case, we have a lower voltage here, which means that we have a higher density of negative charges. So if you assume that you have the same wire with the same capacitance and the same you know, spread outness of the positive charges that constitute the wire, then we would have more closely packed electrons in half of that wire and less densely packed electrons where the voltage was the same as it was up above. I was taking this snapshot and I was taking this snapshot and from that I was inferring how these electrons must have moved in order to be in this arrangement. If I know that I launched this wave from this side, like power supply is over here and this wave is going to be pushing this way, then I know that this electron has not yet moved. So we can say that those are the same electron and those are the same electron and those are the same electron and we can keep doing this. And none of these have moved. I mean, the wave hasn't gotten here yet. So if we assume that all the electrons at the beginning were static, then all the electrons over here where the wave hasn't gotten to yet are also static. I mean, this doesn't even really need to be an assumption because you can say from relativity, like at light speed, the wave hasn't gotten there yet. So these electrons cannot have started to move. By making the assumption, the very good founded in like, relativity fundamentals assumption that these electrons aren't moving, we can say that all of these electrons must have scooted closer together in order to make the voltage here go down. And that means that we've had more electrons that have come in from this edge of the wire. So these are the newly injected electrons and as they push together, they're causing this ripple to move down the wire. So if you know the voltage change on the wire and you know the capacitance of the wire, then you can calculate exactly how many newly injected electrons have been forced into the wire and how far they've gotten, which means that you can calculate a current and you can figure out that there's a current flowing everywhere that this wave has been. In my case, I was using sort of a fake capacitance because I wanted what is effectively a ridiculously low capacitance wire so that the electrons have to move, you know, macroscopic distances and we can see dots on the screen move meters in order to make the effect very clear. In order to get these electron speeds from down below here, these are actually based on direct measurements of current. So I didn't even talk about this in the video, but one of the things that I did, actually I'll go back to the title card, was put a resistor right here and a resistor right here so that I could actually measure how much current when I flipped the switch, plugged in the battery, how much current was flowing into this wire and how much current was flowing out of this wire. And I used those values to scale these speeds. And that's the current value that I'm actually using when I say that there's like 15 milliamps of current in the initial voltage pulse. Now, the second part of this was the program used to make animations. So my program was actually doing this calculation so for every single frame of animation, the program would find a group of electrons that it didn't think were moving, 
and it would look at the change in the voltage profile and then it would crunch all of the rest of the electrons until they matched that voltage profile. And if that meant that new electrons had to be brought in from the edge, it would. This works really, really well until your signal gets to the end of the wire for the very first time, at which point all of your electrons are moving and you no longer have a static reference point that you can use to sort of scale how all your electrons are squishing. That meant that I had to do something more complicated, which turned out to be very difficult, and find a section of wire with the flattest voltage profile. So in this case, once this wave gets all the way to the end and it starts reflecting back, I would probably grab this bit and I would grab all of these electrons and I would say, well, they're moving, but they're all moving at about the same speed. So I would average the speed of some group of electrons in the region of the graph with the flattest voltage. And I would say, these electrons are gonna keep moving at that same speed because nothing interesting is happening there. So I would scoot all of these electrons forward and then I would sort of scrunch all the electrons on both sides of them in accordance with the voltage trace. This, admittedly, is a kludgy way to do it, but it worked. If all the electrons accelerate one way and start moving, and then all the electrons decelerate the other way and stop moving, that means that the integration is working. During the case of the connected wires or with any of the resistive loads applied across those wires, uh, then it was actually not great integration. So much clearer. You can see as the wave goes by, here, we see all the electrons in the wire get accelerated to about the same lower, speed until I, Ohm's law is for satisfied. All of the ones that get cut into the video, I actually stop them at about 700 nanoseconds because beyond that, this fake electron speed, this average blue line that's really clean up until that point, starts to actually slowly decrease. And that is purely an artifact of the integration and the fact that I'm averaging over some group of these fake electron particles and then they're shifting and then they're at a different voltage and I just didn't bother to fix it because it was plenty good enough to demonstrate the effect that I wanted to show. So the next most common comment, especially in the first couple days, was people talking about resonance, comparing this to an antenna or some very particular type of antenna resonator that I didn't know about. But in general, the question, what happens if you pump this circuit at resonance is a fascinating one. And the answer is a Tesla coil. So I have never built a Tesla coil, although I've wanted to since high school. And until working on this project and actually until reading the comments under this project and then going to read about Tesla coils again after having done this and gaining a newfound appreciation for how electricity waves travel in wires, I didn't understand how a Tesla coil worked. So in this video, I'm basically sending this pulse. I'm, you know, giving an inflection right here and there's like a wave and it's traveling down the same way that a wave on a spring would travel. And that wave's gonna go down here, it's gonna be here, and then it's gonna be here, and then it's gonna reflect back, and then it's gonna be here again. But what if at the moment that this wave went that way, you know, that way, and then made it all the way back, you hit it again at the exact right time? Then, you could actually build this wave twice as tall. And then the twice as tall wave would come over here and come over here and then come over here. And then the twice as tall wave would bounce off the end and come back. And then what if you hit it again? Then you'd have a three times as tall wave. And then that one would go back. So every single time that this wave bounces from end to end in the circuit, you have the opportunity to give it just a little more kick. The wave bouncing back and forth is the kid on a swing going back and forth and you applying some sort of you know emf to get a little bit of current to flow at the end of this line is pushing the swing every time you push it the swing goes a little bit higher if you stop pushing the swing eventually the swing dampens back down and that's the resistance in the wire what's actually happening here is that this guy is you know maybe a volt and then this is going to be like 0.99 volts and this is going to be like 0.98 volts so it, it decays slowly but until the rate of decay equals the rate at which you're adding new energy the voltage of this spike is going to keep climbing in a normal transformer you can take some alternating current and you plug it into a transformer and you get some proportion of voltage out the other side as a similarly alternating current. If you put this in at, uh, I don't know, 60 hertz with a three to six ratio of the windings of the coils in the transformer, that means you're gonna get twice the voltage out at 60 hertz. 
and, and this is a nearly frequency independent thing. If you've got a sinusoidally varying voltage, you're gonna get a sinusoidally varying voltage and it's gonna be fine. But this is not how a Tesla coil works. In a Tesla coil, you've got this big toroid up top and then you've got a big coil of wire and then you've got a second coil of wire. So in this case, this is the, the green here is the primary coil, which would be like this one. And then this guy is the secondary coil, but they don't work the same way that a regular transformer does. If you put, you know, a 60 Hertz signal into here, uh, yeah, you're probably going to get some proportion of the number of windings to this coil out. But the way that you get obscenely high voltages out of a Tesla coil is to resonate this. You actually pump it at a resonant frequency. This big toroid at the top is a capacitor and this huge coil is an inductor. That means that you build energy in an electric field up here and you build energy in a magnetic field down here. And this thing will slowly exchange energy between the electric, electric field, magnetic field, electric field, magnetic field. And every time that the energy is stored in the electric field, you give it an extra kick you can get the voltage to build in the exact same way. So now that I understand how this works, I actually really, really want to build a Tesla coil and I want to run, you know, this experiment, except I want to put all of my voltage taps along the secondary coil. Because what I think you'd see, by pumping the primary coil, you'd put your pulse of voltage in here and then that pulse would move down and move down and move down and, and then it would start coming back and then when that pulse gets back to the bottom, you give it another kick with the primary coil. And it's timed precisely so that you give it a kick exactly when the original kick has returned, which means that you double the kick. And then you get that pulse that goes up and down and up and down. So a Tesla coil is literally the experiment that I did in this video, but driven at resonance so that you have a wave that builds and builds and builds. And that wave is traveling up and down the secondary coil of the system. And it's charging and discharging this capacitor at the top. And when that charge gets to be too high, the voltage exceeds the breakdown of air and you get, you know, lightning coming out. Which is very fun. If anybody has a Tesla coil and an oscilloscope laying around and they actually want to just do this, like, please send me the footage because I'm realistically not going to get to that project. But I still really want to see it. Next question on the list, field versus electrons. And the answer to that question is both. You cannot have an electrostatic field without charged particles and you can't make charged particles move without an electric field. There's this big debate in the comment section now about energy and fields and electrons and the answer is that you cannot ignore either side. Technically speaking, the energy that is actually transmitted in an electric circuit is transmitted in accordance with the pointing vector, which is the vector cross product of the electric field and the magnetic field. Now the electric field is emitted from every electron all the time and every proton all the time. The only way to generate an electric field that can drive current and deliver energy via the pointing vector is if you actually move charges around in a wire. You need to have more electrons than protons in some regions and you need to have fewer electrons than protons in other regions. That's how you create a voltage difference. That's how you drive an electric current. And that's how you get the E field part of the pointing vector. The magnetic field is created when electrons are moving or any charged particle is moving. If you want to get really technical, it's because of special relativity and really weird things that happen with length contraction when you have a ridiculous number of moving charges right next to each other, but it's totally fine just to think about it as a magnetic field. And a magnetic field, which is necessary to move energy via the pointing vector, only exists when you have electrons that are moving in a wire or any charged particle moving. But in this case, it's electrons moving in a wire. So when you get two electrons close to each other, their fields repel. Like you can, you can trace the field lines around the electrons and they sort of bend out like this. And this configuration actually stores energy. And it stores energy in the space around the electrons. I've got some better diagrams of this with some simulated 2D slices of 
what this would actually look like in my video about the water channel model, the one that's like <laughs> almost an hour long. No, it's like 40 minutes long. So strictly speaking, the energy of an electron configuration is actually stored in the field around the electrons. But it doesn't really make sense to disconnect that field from the electrons and the motion of the electrons because that field wouldn't exist without the electrons. So really, you can, you can use the pointing formalism and you can say, yes, the energy is localized in a region uh, around the wire according to this cross product. And that means that the energy is actually being transmitted by the fields. But the fields are being created by the existence and motion of charged particles. And those charged particles wouldn't be moving if there wasn't an E field. So it's, it's all very cyclical. Like you can't disconnect these two things. It doesn't make sense to say that electrons are pushing on each other like billiard balls. And it doesn't make sense to say that fields are pushing on each other without electrons doing anything. Actually, arguably billiard balls do push on each other with electric fields. But I, it's beside the point. Next question. What was the next question? Ah, lots of people angry, angry about anthropomorphizing. Uh, <laughs> I'm not, even, I'm not even going to draw anything for this one. When you're dealing with things that are occurring at about the speed of light, the primary thing that I was concerned about with making this video was causality, like not breaking causality. Information and how information is transmitted through space is a real thing. It's a real concept in physics. So to say that one region of space has knowledge of some event and some other region of space doesn't yet have knowledge of that event is really making an argument about light speed and the ability for information to transmit distances in space. That's why I used so much anthropomorphic language at the beginning of this video. From the perspective of understanding electronics, it doesn't help as much. Uh, I, I totally get it. The people that were like, you know, electrons don't know anything. It's like, no, of course electrons don't know anything. But it is a really common way for physicists to talk about things. And it sort of becomes a shorthand for describing really complicated events. There were a couple times that I used the phrase like negotiation or that there was information being sent back and forth along the circuit. And I totally stand by those statements. There was a wave of voltage, a wave of potential and sort of scrunching electrons that was moving up and down these wires. And every time that that wave was modified by the local environment, for example, hitting a dead end versus hitting a short circuit, it changed that wave. And the character of that wave was altered by that moment. And it was altered by, you know, physically local things. And then that wave started moving back towards the battery. Because that wave had been modified, it was taking information about the end of the circuit towards the battery. So I don't think it's far-fetched at all to say that, you know, this region of space with the battery and the switch and the circuit ends up learning about the far end of the circuit based on the signal that comes back. And when I say that it's learning about the far end of the circuit, I mean the behavior of the battery and switch changes based on something that happens at the far end of the circuit. But it has to wait to equilibrate. The behavior of the battery and circuit at this end changes only after the information has, has left and come back. And I think that negotiation is actually a really reasonable way to phrase it. It sort of bounces back and forth and back and forth. So it changes the current here and then the wave goes here and it changes the current here and then the wave goes here and it changes the current here. And eventually the two currents will, will bounce and you know, they're both at the beginning bouncing a lot and then they eventually end up stabilizing and end up evening out. In my mind, a, a negotiation in the physical sense is like having a, say you've got a mass that's suspended by two different springs sandwiched in between two immovable objects. If you have that mass in the center and then you release it, it's gonna bounce back and forth and eventually it's gonna find an equilibrium. I would argue that a valid way to talk about this problem is that this system is sort of trying to find an equilibrium point in between the extension of the thick spring and the extension of the thin spring. So at the beginning, the thick spring is gonna push a lot harder and, and the mass is gonna go down. And then the mass is, because it has mass, going to overshoot. It's got some inertia. So it's gonna end up doing this. And then 
the thin spring is going to be really compressed and the thick spring isn't going to be very compressed at all despite the fact that it's thicker. So you're going to round the corner, you're going to come back up and it's going to do this and eventually it's going to even out. This sort of thing happens all the time in physics. It's a stable equilibrium and it's the reason that we can predict most anything. If you ever have a case where you have an unstable equilibrium, you're probably not studying it for very long. All right, point five. Water is more compressible than electrons. This is such a frustrating point because it really depends on the situation, what sort of physics model you're trying to solve. Do you want water to be compressible? Would it simplify the problem if water was compressible? Or would it simplify the problem if water was not compressible? Why do we say that water is incompressible? Well, if you're using water in a hydraulic system like this, say you want to push down on this piston and then water is going to scoot through here and it's going to push up on this piston. In this situation, you would be insane to consider water compressible. If you want to calculate, you know, how many, how far down this is going to move, and then you want to calculate how far up this is going to move as a result. Maybe these don't have the same area, so you've got to do some math. You know, as hard as you push on this water, uh, if you've got like a big weight over here, uh, and you're pushing that up against gravity, then you're gonna compress this water. You're gonna squish it down in order to make these pistons move. But it's probably gonna go from like 100% of its original volume to like 99.999% of its original volume. So if you say, I'm gonna push down on this piston and the volume of the water in this cylinder, the water of the volume in the pipe and the water of the, and the volume of the water in this cylinder, the sum of those is not going to change. At most, you're gonna be off by like 0. 0.000 something percent. So making the assumption that water is incompressible is absolutely the correct assumption to make. However, when we're analyzing transients, like these electric circuits, and like if you were to hit this water with a sledgehammer, you sort of have to assume that water is compressible. Imagine that you start pushing on this cylinder all of a sudden, what happens? Well, water is going to go from this cylinder into the hose. But how could that happen? Like, why, why does the water leave the cylinder? The water in the cylinder has to be at a higher pressure than the water in the hose in order for water to move from the cylinder to the hose and eventually to the other cylinder. In order for water to be at different pressures, it has to actually be slightly compressed. Like, you know, you've got all these water molecules, well, I'm gonna draw them as, as, uh, as circles because, you know, circles are easy to draw. But you've got all these molecules and then you shove them together and you pack them more, more densely together, they're going to actually squish together. Like they're gonna end up closer together after you've pushed on them. And the repulsive force that they don't want to be pushed that close together, you know, all these, all these molecules are trying to push each other away, that is the pressure. Pressure and density are related. It's just that you don't need to change the density very much for water to make the pressure go up astronomically, which is why it's said to be very incompressible. It's not uncompressible. It's just very incompressible. Are those words? And if we really want to look at a scale of compressibility, we could go from gases, where you need to change the volume a lot in order to change the pressure, to liquids, where you need to change the volume very little in order to change the pressure by a lot, or we can look at something like electrons that repel each other so strongly that you barely, barely need to change the density of electrons in order to have truly obscene forces pushing them apart. So it's easier to imagine electricity as a gas because you can imagine that a gas is compressible. But it's more accurate to say that electricity is like water because it's less compressible. 
But really, it's not accurate to say it's like either of them because it's so incompressible that it's not even funny. Yes, they're, they're all some level of compressible and that means that they all work the same way because you're sort of scrunching electrons up and then pushing more electrons forward or scrunching gas up and pushing gas forward or scrunching up water molecules and pushing the rest of the water molecules forward. Like they all work the same way, but electricity is on such a vastly different scale because the forces between charged particles are huge. Which unfortunately makes it very difficult to understand and very difficult to teach without simplifications that get messy in a hurry because they're simplifications with caveats. Number six on the list, but waves and wave functions and altering the experiment by observing it. Up front, I wanna say there is nothing quantum about the experiment that I have portrayed in this video at all. You can say that quantum physics is involved in how the electrons are allowed to move through the wires and like what makes the wires conductive. But for that matter, I could say that this pen is quantum because it's quantum physics that allows the bonding and the plastic to work. It has nothing to do with its operation as a pen. But the argument that people were trying to make here was an argument about quantum physics that you, you know, in quantum physics, there's this concept that if you have a particle that's in or some sort of quantum system that's in a superposition of multiple states, the act of observing that system or somehow operating on that system can result in collapsing the state of superposition and you just end up with a particle in one state. My favorite way to think about that is uh, that the square of the wave function is the probability. So I sort of think of wave functions as probabilities of places that the particle could be, states that the particle could be in. And I know that that's not totally accurate because like, there's a reason that we calculate the probability as the square of the wave function. But in order for it to make sense in my head, I think of it that way. All of that is completely different than what was happening here when I was altering the experiment by measuring it. The most tangible analogy that I can come up with here is uh, a mechanical system. Imagine that you've got a car that's not powered by anything, that's just rolling down the road, and you wanna get something like the speed of that car over time. And you might say, yeah, the car's gonna slow down and it's gonna look something like that as the car sort of coasts to a halt. Now, how do you measure this? You need to be able to measure the speed of the car. So imagine that the way that you measured the speed of the car was to have, you know, an idler that, that falls down here with a, a wheel. So you've got this thing hanging off the back of the car with like a little wheel. Maybe it's a, it's a toothed wheel here so that it rubs against the ground with a lot of friction. And there's like a generator in there. So you, you create a little bit of a current and you measure that in order to learn the speed of the car. Well, now that you've attached this thing that's measuring the speed of the car, you've actually added drag to the car, which means that the speed is going to look something more like that. So you've actually altered the experiment. You've reduced the speed of the car artificially by measuring the speed of the car. For any measurement that you make of any physical system, I think ever, you're going to encounter a problem like this. The good news is that in the majority of cases, you can measure something like the macroscopic motion of a car with a sensor that is many orders of magnitude less important than that car, which means that the actual line is going to be basically right on the original line. So yes, are you altering the experiment by measuring it? Absolutely. But is the value that you're measuring something like you know, 99.9999% of the real value, the real value, unmeasured value, uh, then you just don't care. Because there are other sources, because there are other sources of noise in your experiment that are larger than the bias that is introduced by your data collection apparatus. This is actually the most significant mental hurdle right now in recreating the, the Veritasium, you know, long loop of wire experiment but with the ability to measure the electricity waves, you know, moving around this loop. If you actually spread the loop out by like a meter, then you've got stray capacitances everywhere and the scope ends up being a pretty large factor in the circuit. So you stop being able to measure all the way along this thing with the scope without having a problem. Unless you add a ground plane underneath the whole experiment, 
and then you're arguably changing the experiment because now you have capacitive coupling between this wire and the ground and this wire and the ground when it's really just supposed to be capacitive coupling between these two wires. So uh, yes, when you get certain physical systems, it becomes very difficult to measure them without altering the results. But the vast majority of electronic wires are not individual wires spread meters apart with uh, very small currents passing in between them that are very difficult to measure. The vast majority of circuits are small, dense, with you know ground near them so that all of the fields are contained and they're really easy to measure. These are not things that you normally have to worry about, even in electronics, and they're really not things you have to worry about when you're looking at cars. Actually, I thought of a better example, an actually almost negligible way to measure the speed of this car, but still does clearly affect the result. If you've got this thing dangling down that's creating drag, that might affect the result. But if you get rid of this and you add a radar gun over here, where you actually send you know, radar waves out, the radar waves bounce off the car and come back. And you look at the Doppler shift of the radar waves to figure out how fast the car is going. In that case, you actually have photons hitting the car. Like there are optical forces, there's light pressure pushing on the car. So in this case, the car is going that way and you're measuring it from back here, you actually might see the car slow down less quickly because you're sort of pushing on the car with light from the back in order to measure it. But of course, friction with the road on the tires is going to be so much more important than the tiny, tiny, tiny bit of force that you're applying with this light. So is it possible to measure the speed of a car without affecting the speed of a car? Probably not, but also, yes. So the last one on this list is really fun phasing around the country. After this video came out, I exchanged emails with Grady from Practical Engineering, and a question that I had for him after looking at all of this stuff was, how do we keep, you know, an entire power grid in phase? So the power grid has to invert 60 times per second. Well, actually it inverts 120 times per second for a total period of 60 hertz. So really you want all the voltages going up at one, yeah, I should draw this. So the power grid is just lots and lots and lots of wires in parallel, effectively. So imagine that we've got, you know, uh, a house over here. That's a very tall house. Okay. And then you've got a house over here. And then you've got a um, power plant over here. You know, something spinning a turbine. Then say you've got another power plant over here. A simplified version of this, a big system running on AC, you can imagine that you've got two wires that connect all of these things. And these two wires are physically close to one another. Now, at any point in the power grid here, our very simple power grid, you can measure the potential difference between these two wires to get the voltage. And over time, this voltage changes. So you'd end up with something like that. Now, imagine that this generator was producing this sine wave of voltage, as generators do, and then it needs to propagate that out to the rest of the grid. If you have an electric power plant that's somewhere in New York, and you have a house, say somewhere in Ohio, those are connected by transmission lines that are really, really long. There are also power plants in Ohio and there are also houses in New York, but at some point you have all these lines that are actually connected. So how do you make sure that when this generator is going high and then low and then high, that this generator over here isn't going middle, high, low, middle? Like th there's a, there could be a phase shift here. Like that could be a problem. If you've got two generators, that are doing different things at the same moment at different ends of the grid, you've got a problem because then at some point in the middle here, you're sort of averaging these together. And at some point, these are gonna be actually working against each other and you're gonna have forces doing all sorts of bad things. So you don't want this, but this is an amazing logistical problem because this is 482 miles. On a really big power line, I actually don't know, I guess I assume that it's very close to the speed of light. When you've got the power lines that are, that are doing this, the, the really big high tension lines, you know, on the, on the towers that look like this, like this, this distance is huge. And then the distance to the ground plane is also huge. So I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say that the speed of 
electricity transmission in these power lines is almost C. Somebody correct me on that if I'm wrong. But as a worst case scenario, uh, let's say we have the speed of light going 482 miles. There we go. So it takes 2.5 milliseconds for any signal to get from our New York generator to our Ohio home. Now, one complete cycle of power here is uh, 16 milliseconds, 17 milliseconds. So if the transmission delay between these two locations is like three milliseconds, then there's no way to synchronize these to a reasonable amount. If this is three milliseconds, then, you know, at best, you're looking at something being that far out of phase, which would be really bad. So when you've got a huge grid, you can imagine that there are phases sort of propagating outwards from various sources and propagating outwards from various loads. And all of these things have to eventually average together into something cohesive that works. So this is the link that Grady sent me. This is a live phase angle offset for the Eastern Interconnect, which you can see is a power grid that covers the majority of the United States. Now, Grady complained, and I will too, about there not being a scale on this color bar up here, because I would love to know, you know, what's the maximum deflection? Like how far off can these waveforms get? What's this shift? But the bottom line is there is a shift and you can see that it sort of moves throughout the country. I'm sure that if we sat here for, you know, a day, we'd probably watch some of these splotches move around as, you know, the equilibrium is shifting and different loads are being used at different times by different parts of the country. But I just think this is really cool because it's, it's this experiment. This experiment, but scaled way up. You've got a whole bunch of batteries, a whole bunch of generators, power plants at different locations, and you've got oodles of different loads. And they're all separated by milliseconds of delay time, which is like crazy slow. And they're trying to run a signal that oscillates on a scale of milliseconds, which means that really all of this stuff has to be in sync and sort of better sync than you'd be able to do if you were just sending, you know, laser beams between all these places. It really makes you think hard about it. And I think that it's awesome to see this, you know, I, I wrote the simplest circuit, you know, which way is the current going to flow? But when you scale that up to a, an entire country and all of the wires, all of the cables that are connected across the entire country, like you can see this happening in real time. And I think that that's really neat. So with that, I think I've exhausted the list for this Q&A video. Uh, keep them coming though. If there are any good questions in the comments, I always try to answer them. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.